a little bit on the backwards practice, that's also a memorization technique. And so it, you know, what it does is kind of, it does sort of keep you out of like, oh, I just want to hear what it sounds like mode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and so, exactly. And so, and you're, al you're building upon the notes, and so you begin to almost, you begin to memorize that, those uh, passages. So I, I give that to you as a really efficient way to practice. Um, on E9, E, uh, E10, E11, and E12, those all work good for isolation of trouble spots. The bracketed things that I told you on, on the eternal principles, you just use A9, 10, 11, and 12, and you will probably realize some quick um, uh, fixes, maybe. And piano practice, 14. For, uh, I think it was Frank who said, for every 15 minutes of organ practice, practice one hour on the piano. I think he said that. He's, he's dead. I can't. <laughs> 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 but, but, when you practice on the piano, use your organ technique, the legato, to get the notes. It's a deeper touch usually, and, and so use the heavy arm weight. Don't be playing like you would normally play, your, play the piano, you know, uh, with a piano touch. And don't forget, practice your scales, practice your arpeggios on the piano. Now, you have different kinds of practicing. We've been learning notes. Uh, now we can talk a little bit about polishing the performance. Hmm. You, okay, how do you polish? Because it's, uh, Bob Rayfield, my organ teacher, said to me, he said, you know, it's the last 1% of getting those pieces to performance ready level. And that's the hardest part, actually. Um, so uh, you could use E7 through 14 again. But there's some other things you can do. Practice with your eyes shut. And that's an interesting thing. First of all, it checks your memory, <laughs> obviously. And um, you'll see that you'll begin to see your hands and your feet as you have your eyes shut. It's in that like, little video that runs in your head. And um, that's helpful at times. Then something I fell upon, oh, this was back when I was teaching at Concordia University. I read a piano journal. And they, it's number three. Practice, um, this didn't, it didn't say practice with your dominant eye closed. That's my thing. <laughs> but I, it got me to thinking. I read this article on EMDR. And it's, then what that means is eye movement desensitiz desensitization and reprocessing. Anybody know about this? Yes, good. Um, it's used in uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. It's used in performance anxiety, and in this case, in the piano journal, that's what it was <laughs> for. But, but it is a form of performance anxiety, a, a form of uh, stress. And, and so what it does is retrain your eye how it moves across the page. So it got me to thinking. I was like, I was learning, um, or bringing back actually, but I, I don't think I did this when I was uh, first learning the piece, but when I was bringing back a piece, it was Rager's Opus 73, and there's this one page that the eighth note, I think, is as a, like, um, or sixteenth, I can't remember what the tempo is, it's like 176. And your hands are going from three manuals, there's no time to think. Three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, two, and you, it's just, you no time to think. And so I took I, my right eye, I'm right eye dominant, and I shut my right eye and practiced using solely left eye rhythms doing I combined these techniques and you know in performance it just worked it was smooth as silk so you might try that that's a, I, at the very least it's another way to keep your brain fresh because it's really strange to look at a score with one eye and I would switch eyes sometimes too and use my dominant eye but um, it forced your left eye to work harder <laughs> too so that you might try some experiments like that. I did once know a student of mine who turned off all the lights in the church and practiced with a black light on. That, so that's a possibility. Number four, who remembers um, Greg Louganis? Ah yes, okay, Greg Louganis. Um, he was the diver in the Olympics and they asked him, 
Because remember how he was just perfection. Remember this? He, he would climb the ladder, and he would go on the platform, and from the climbing of the ladder to taking off in the air to his form in the air to his entry into the water without a splash. And it was just always perfect. And they asked him, and he said, well, I visualize. So what you can do, you take your music. It's mental practice, and it's covert or imaginary rehearsal of a skill without muscular movement. You are just sitting there. And this was what Greg Luganus did. He said, I go in the locker room or, or on the bench on the side of the pool or wherever. I'm sitting there running through from the minute I get up off this bench to walk over to the ladder to how I'm going to climb the ladder. I see myself in my mind's eye doing these things and how I will take off and how I will. And so it's pre-rehearsed without any muscular movement. And you can do this away, away from the organ console, and you should. Um, when I'm on the road and performing, I take my scores, I sit on the hotel bed, and I, I play the whole recital in my mind with the score, just, and I see my hands and feet moving. I'm playing the, I'm actually playing it in my head. You should try that. It will, in performance anyway, it helps center you and quiet you, quiet your mind, but, and it gives you focus, it just, it, it helps your focus. But it also helps you in learning notes, I believe. You know, polishing your performances. Because you know how you want it to sound. Correct. Maybe you haven't quite got it there it, yet, it, but you truly really want to hear it in your mind. OK? Another way to polish your performance is to practice at uh, half or 3 quarters tempo. Uh, <laughs> so often, students will come in and they will play the piece 10 times up to tempo, loud at full blast, and well, they're, at some point they're almost tearing down their work that they have worked so hard to do. It gets sloppy. So maybe allow yourself one time through at tempo in a day, and the rest of the time practice at half or three quarters. Do, now this is fun to do during the sermon, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you can, um, I, I guess if the keys click, you probably shouldn't do it. Uh, dead manual practice. You're hearing the music in your head, but it's dead manual, and you're kind of, at least when you turn the organ back on uh, from the sermon, you won't be cold, you know, but pro you probably really don't want to do that on, your, on the sermon. The clergy don't like that usually. Um, seven. <laughs> the clergyman's an organist, he'll understand. <laughs> this is true, he may, or she may. Um, seven, record and listen to yourself with a score in hand, critically, with a pencil in hand, and make notes of what you should go back to, look at. Because it's amazing, we're at this console, and if, if you're, like at the University of Alabama, I'm at a console that's a tracker, it's, you know, two stories high, and you don't hear what's going on in the room. So in polishing your performance, you really want to know about your articulation, your registrations, pacing, that sort of thing. And so if you have a good recorder, uh, then get that out and use it. It's a t great tool. And mark your scores. Okay, G, maintaining at performance level. Now this is kind of hard. Um, as some of my students will, uh, get a great recital worked up, and then they, it's really hard to keep that level of intensity and uh, the level of performance accuracy because your mind is no longer fresh. You have learned the music, and well, I know this stuff, you know, sitting back on your laurels, so to speak. And, and really, how do you keep that level at a high performance level? Well, slow practice again and playing at the half and three quarters tempo. And you know what, you'll, you'll come back, and I was talking with a friend of mine even outside here, you go back a few years later and those same trouble spots that you had then are still there. <laughs> so in maintaining performance level and in reviving new pieces, just gravitate towards what you marked 10 years ago, at your trouble spots, and rehearse those, you know, very diligently. And once again, only play the work at, at, at tempo uh, once during your daytime. 
and bringing your music back, say you left it for 10 years and you want to bring it back, go ahead and do all these things that I've explained to you and uh, it should, you know, pick and choose, combine them. Maybe you've got, and we'll, we'll ask if anybody has some helpful hints on how they practice, because I'm sure we'd all be interested. There are two more, though, extra eternal principles I wish to discuss. What, you know, I talked about these surefire practice techniques, and I think it's the students I get. Um, the, many of them are fabulous players, and, but I have to teach sometimes they don't know how to practice. Now, these two probably knew how to practice, but I have, it's very common to need to teach practice techniques because people don't know how. Um, but the other two things that are maybe not directly related to learning repertoire but are important, and I think they really do help in some way learn repertoire, sight reading. That's the other skill that people, they, they seem to think either I have it or I don't. That's not true. You can learn it. And it's not a terminal disease. You just need to do it. And as in anything, you're building a habit, you're learning a skill. So sight read daily, if it's a weak point especially, sight read daily. Sight read, if you're a newcomer to our field, sight read your hymnal, starting with like the first hymn and go 10 hymns. Don't stop to fix anything. Just keep it moving. Pick a tempo that you can play everything pretty accurately without any stops and just move on through. Keep your eyes moving forward. If you have a friend, you can take a card and actually cover the notes as you go along, not allowing you to back up. You can't back up. You have to keep moving forward. Sight read. I remember my piano teacher. <laughs> she had this a room, a, a, a living room, about a quarter of the size of this, two grand pianos, and then the room was filled with walls lined with stacks of music this tall. And we, every week, had to pick out a new stack of music and sight read all of it, and then bring it back the following and bring, change it out. Stacks of music, go through them. Practice sight reading straight through at a tempo you can manage. Do not fix anything, and do this daily for 10 to 15 minutes. A second eternal principle is practice your hymns daily. Like, I mean as, now I'm not talking sight reading, I'm talking, you know, the clergy gives you your hymns or you pick out your hymns. Don't wait till Saturday. First of all, you're going to dress them up, so you want to kind of, you know, check them out and maybe have your mind going on what you might like to improvise on or, or do free hymn accompaniments, whatever. Uh, but practice them as much as you might practice your repertoire. Hymn playing and sight reading are your bread and butter. They really are. You're all working in churches. And so if you can't sight read and you can't play hymns, go work at Walmart. <laughs> because, because, because playing hymns in churches is probably, that is the most probably important skill that we have. And leading corporate worship and leading corporate singing is our most important job. And if it is distracting, you're not doing your job. So now, I'd like to open up the floor. We've got, I think, about five minutes. Not a comment, but a question. We're ready. Uh, will, these be, will these handouts be on the web, or is there they're, a way to get some more? They're on my web page. Okay. Actually, the, what's on the web uh, for the AGO is just your handout. But if you go on my web page, you have my entire lecture, the notes. Okay. And um, that's www.faithfreeze.com. And it's actually, I think it's at the top of the handout, too. So if you want all the filler in between your outline form, you can get that on my website. Do you have any suggestions for making the transition between your practice work and a performance work, particularly where pistons might be? Oh, you know what I do? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a three and a half uh, rank Schlicker organ at home that I practice on. And, um, and of course, I've got the concert hall organ, which has ten generals and a sequencer and, um, you know, uh, all kinds of, of things. And I take little post-it notes on my Schlicker, because it's sometimes hard to get into the concert hall. I take little post-it notes and I put little pistons on, under, on the little fingerboard there. And um, I'll I aim at them, or I'll kick the knee board. <laughs> but I, I practice, even though I'm on a like no pistons uh, organ, I will still practice the moves. Okay. 
it is helpful, I think, because if you don't, and then all of a sudden you're on this organ that's got all these things. Boy, are you out of luck. <laughs> and okay, I appreciate your attentiveness and thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.